we have met you before and it has always been a pleasure to have you on such discussions. But I just want, to, before we get into the collaboration aspect, you have been involved in wildlife conservation for quite uh, a part of your, uh, your, your life. So even as we just begin, just introduce yourself and uh, just tell me how long you have been in the work of you know, uh, animal and wildlife conservation. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Uh, my journey with the wildlife conservation started from the village from uh, when I was young, in the 70s when we were young guys. And then uh, it solidified in uh, 2000 when I joined the Kenya Wildlife Service. And uh, I've been uh, having a career of uh, 24 years of active service. And that career has culminated into my appointment as the Director General of the Kenya Wildlife Service. And uh, looking back, I can only see the service as a privilege, not just to serve my people in Kenya, but to serve the world in terms of ensuring that we are able to conserve the assemblage of wildlife, the diversity of the indigenous species that are in this country. One of the most dramatic things that uh, I would want the world to know is that uh, I am uh, a specialist in hippopotamus conservation. Yes. I spent my time here four years doing research on this Mala River, on the hippos that are actually at, at, uh, at my background. And um, I was uh, trying to assist the communities and the wildlife management entities understand how livestock and the glaciers can be able to coexist. One of the fundamental things that I was able to discover was that uh, the hippopotamus are ecosystem engineers. They are able in the course of their grazing to cut grass into low, medium and high and all the other species are able to align up there and find at various levels including livestock and that was actually game changing in the sense that you can have what we call mixed feeding systems. Uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service, what is the, 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 the service's mandate here in Kenya? Our mandate uh, Jerry is uh, to conserve protect and manage wild drive across the entire country and uh, we are privileged with uh, my team of uh, professionals that are very highly dedicated to directly manage 8.2 percent of this country in terms of uh, national parks, national reserves, the sanctuaries and the marine reserves and marine national parks. Then on top of that we have been able to uh, engage the communities and we have, the communities have set aside another 12.8% in terms of community conservancies and private conservancies. So cumulatively, this country has uh, set aside more than 20% of the country's landmass, specifically dedicated for wildlife land use. That gives KWS a huge mandate because we are the drivers of the conservation movement in this country. We love, we love partnerships, we love collaborations, and we are taking the country into a higher level of ensuring that we have driving wildlife population that are coexisting with the local communities, and we are providing the product that the tourism, the tourists are coming to see this country. Jerry, don't be surprised that 75% of the visitors who come to this country, they come for a safari. And the safari is synonymous to wildlife viewing. So the mandate of KWS puts us squarely into the economic growth of this country. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. And I'm going to still expound this conversation further to the you know, national spectrum. Uh, but before I do that, I want to now just narrow down to the Maasai Mara where we are right now. What is this ecosystem's uh, value uh, to you know, the country and also uh, to the people that seek to visit it? Good, Jerry. Um, Maasai Mara is a unique place in the history and uh, the economic dynamics of this country. One is that the Mala is a driver of the tourism. The Mala is the one that beckons all the visitors in this country. Then when the visitors come in, we have what we call the spillover effect. You have people in, uh, the, uh, people in the transport industry, you have the tour operators. You have the people that are running the aircraft in this country. You have the hotel operators. You have the tour guides. You have the communities that are getting income. And that spillow effect gets across the entire country. So Mala is at the nerve center of growing the tourism economy in this country. And we are privileged to have a working governor. We are privileged to have a management here that has tried and has actually come of range and grown the product here to the acceptance of the tourists. So for us, 
Mala is where you start and then you visit all the other sites in this country. In terms of importance, number one, in terms of our tourism. In terms of attracting good research in wildlife, Mala becomes number one. So now just narrowing back uh, to the migration, how important is it to this ecosystem? Um, from my background of science, the world beast migration is the best ecological phenomena that you can witness anywhere in this world. Yeah. Number one, uh, the wild beasts are following food in space and time, and their food is grass. Mala is what you call a mesic savanna. It's a wet savanna. So by the time we get to May, June, July, you have tall grass here. So the wild beast would move all the way from Serengeti. And on their way, they are followed by the other glaciers, they are followed by the zebras, they are followed by the Thompson gazelles, they are followed by the grand gazelles. Then follows the predators. So it is a dynamic web of interdependence. By the time they get to Masai Mala, they cut this grass that you're seeing here completely short. Then all the other species are able to rearrange themselves and find at the level that they are able to find. And the predators come in. They take what they can be able to take. So the balance of this system is actually set by the movement of the wild beast from Tanzania to Kenya. And into Masai Mara, Masai Mara is the climax mm -hmm. of the movement. This is the theater where you really see the dynamism of the place and the predators. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, you are responsible for about 20% of the country's landmass, and that is not some light responsibility that has been placed on your shoulder and on the shoulders of uh, the service. Uh, but you, I would imagine, would need a lot of collaborations, both be, uh, within the country and without the country. What are some of these collaborations that KWS uh, has uh, put in place to just ensure that uh, the responsibility that has been bestowed on it uh, continues moving on? Our first collaborator is actually the government, the main government itself. Yeah. The current government has a very clear better uh, program and better initiative that has pronounced the environmental agenda that we are supposed to have in this country. So we start with the restoration of our habitats, we start with planting trees and then we move in into the other national space. We have quite a number of uh, entities, uh, partners that we are collaborating with in this country starting from the cutting-edge science that we do in wildlife conservation moving in into technology that cuts across east and west and the north. Then you move in into the communities. We do a lot of collaborations with the community to sustain the 12.8% of the lands that are outside the protected areas to ensure that we can grow the world population and we make sure that they thrive in times and space. So collaboration is a key thing and we welcome all partners across to come and work with us to come and ensure that oh, our great-grandchildren who are coming after us, they should be able to find this migration functioning. That is the cornerstone of our mandate. Yes, and I would imagine even with collaborations, there is a lot of, you know, learning from each other. And Kenya has, uh, for a very long time, been a beacon of, beacon of hope in terms of uh, restoration of uh, animal populations, conservation of wildlife, and also just, you know, helping other countries uh, take a leaf or two uh, from what the country has done. What are some of uh, these uh, ways that other countries, you know, might want to learn from Kenya in their own ways of protecting wildlife? Uh, basically, Kenya has been a leader in uh, wildlife conservation and uh, we collaborate a lot uh, with uh, other entities internally and externally. One area that we have clearly excelled in is in the recovery of our endangered species. Yeah. We have developed species specific action plans. We have been able over the last 30 years to bring our elephant pop population from a mere 16,000 and now we are boosting of more than 36,000 elephants in this country. We have been able to recover our lino population from a mere 300 in the last 30 years. Now we are boosting of more than 2,000 linos in this country. The, the, the lion populations in this country, we are seeing it growing and we are boosting of more than 2,400 lions that are traversing this landscape. This cannot be possible without the collaborations and the partnership that we have created over time and the technology that we've been able to benefit from from our partners all over.
Yes, and as I was mentioning earlier at the beginning of uh, this live stream, uh, the local guides here have a very interesting lingo uh, just to identify the animals as they are moving around during safaris and offering guide services for the tourists that visit the Masai Mara National Reserve. And I mentioned earlier uh, that, for instance, uh, the lion is commonly known here locally as Kicho because of its beautiful mane and uh, the powerful and very vibrant hair, hair that it has on uh, the face. And he has mentioned elephants and rhinos. The elephant fans here in the local lingo here used by uh, the guides is known as masikio which translates uh, loosely to uh, ears uh, so they with their big ears which uh, you know also act as uh, fans for the elephants during uh, high temperatures uh, that is what uh, they come to be identified they have come to be identified with and for the rhinos uh, because of the horns uh, that are standing tall beautifully right in front of uh, their eyes they are called pembe which uh, translates uh, to uh, horn. Uh, so these are some of the things that I also just want to talk about. Uh, there needs to be a very strong collaboration between the service and uh, these local guides and the people that you know operate within the, uh, the, the parks on a day-to-day -day basis uh, because they, are also, they also play a very important part in terms of animal conservation and also just uh, holding down this ecosystem as it is. How important is it then to ensure that KWS continues to nurture these relationships with uh, such uh, people like uh, the local guides here? Thank you. Um, the local guides and the two operators are one of our first line of defense, especially when it comes to looking at the welfare of the wildlife that are in the protected species, including the conservancy species. We have uh, very clear networks. We have the Kenya Association of two operators that we speak with, we talk with on, on a weekly basis. We have the tour guide associations that are able to reach to us and we are able to handle and tackle any things of interest and we compare notes on a daily basis. Actually, KWS has been a huge trainer of the tour guides. All the tour guides that are in the landscape of Kenya, they pass through the hands of KWS officers in terms of training so they can learn how to handle our visitors, but above all, how to report back to us if they see anything that is happening in the protected landscape and on our animals here. Mm. Yes. And the noises that you hear right behind us, we have a very beautiful backdrop of the river and uh, along the river we can see hippopotamus herds and we can also see some giant crocodiles there. And there are some noises that you also hear which are very distinct and those are from uh, the Egyptian geese and we have talked about uh, them quite a lot in our broadcast and even in previous uh, broadcasts. But I just want to also just give you a peek into what other things the Mara offers in terms of even just uh, the birds. In the Mara you find Africa's largest eagle which is the Marshall Eagle. We have had a chance before to witness the Marshall Eagle uh, during a hunt. It wasn't successful uh, for us probably that might have been something that was disappointing to see but it was something that is magnificent. One of the largest uh, birds in the world being here in the Mara, the largest eagle, uh, the, the Marshall Eagle which is the largest eagle in Africa. Uh, we had a chance to see that and uh, these are some of the things that then uh, people get to see in the Mara. More than a hundred different species of mammals and birds. Uh, you see a lot of animals on land and you also see other animals in the water. And we have an engagements even with some of our guides here and some of the people that we have spoken to before and they say even beneath the water there are animals that we cannot see. And that just speaks to the richness of the Maasai Mara. So how important is it then to ensure that we get it right for future generations? For the future generations, not just for the Mala, we are very clear key priorities, Jerry, that uh, is, uh, is a service we are setting. Number one is that uh, we are in the forefront of mitigating the impact of climate change. Climate change is our threat number one. We need to mitigate climate change and ensure that our landscapes are remaining friendly to the thriving wildlife species and to ensure that the generations that are coming, the visitors that, that are coming, are seeing uh, what you are calling healthy habitats and healthy and healthy wildlife. Number two, what we are doing, uh, Jerry, is that uh, we are doing a lot of coexistence and partnership programs with our communities. Because if you look at the movement of the wild beast, the wild beast are moving beyond the boundary of the protected national reserves. So we need the buy-in from the communities to ensure that we establish what we call community conservancies. We are driving benefit sharing into those spaces to ensure that those particular community members that are allowing wildlife to be in their spaces. They can peacefully and harmoniously coexist with them. Then finally, we have a serious agenda of growing a thriving wildlife population 
and ecologically sound habitats to ensure that our populations keep on growing. But they don't only keep on growing, we ensure that the ecosystem integrity is kept in, in shape here. And that is particularly driving us to ensuring that the threatened areas, the endangered species, we keep them in balance and they grow. So much to learn from you, Doctor. I'm yes. so proud to have had a chance to sit down with you just to, you know, pick your brain on a, a couple of things. And of course, we would have sat for even longer if time had allowed us. But remember, we have been uh, with you, giving you various insights uh, from uh, Dr. Erastus Kanga, who is the Director General of the Kenya Wildlife Service. We hope you have had a chance to enjoy everything that we have been uh, streaming for you from wherever part of the world. You have been watching us across the different social media platforms. We have had a chance to plant our cameras across different locations. Uh, across the park uh, to try and bring you as many uh, animal features as we possibly could uh, from uh, this national national reserve and remember we came here our our time here has coincided with the Great Migration 2024 and this is the time when millions of animals involved including uh, wildebeests, zebras and um, impalas uh, migrate all the way from Tanzania Serengeti National Park which neighbors the Masai Mara National Reserve here in Narrow County and the animals stay here for about three to four months grazing on the lush uh, savanna grass that will have uh, been uh, protected here by the KWS team and of course the wardens here uh, before returning back to the Serengeti National Park. And this migration cycle itself has been captured uh, very vastly with, uh, by the Kenyan authorities here. Uh, they have been able to identify the behavioral patterns of the animals. Uh, for instance, uh, the animals get to mate, the wildebeest get to mate in the Serengeti National Reserve before coming here. Uh, to, uh, to, they mate here in uh, the Masai Mara National Reserve before uh, calving in uh, the Serengeti National Park and then bringing uh, the uh, calves again into the Mara in a continuous cycle that goes all year round. Uh, I have been your host, Jerry O'Willy, and we, together with the CGT and Africa crew, we have been based here for the past three days to bring you this uh, great phenomenon that has been included as one of the seven natural wonders of the world to capture the Great Migration 2024. We hope you have had a great time with us, and we do hope you you are able uh, to have learned something from uh, the discussions that we have had on this. So we are going to leave you again uh, with our cameras as you continue enjoying the Mara one last time. Uh, we hope uh, you can catch more animals. We have the lions here, we have the cheetahs here, we have the elephants, we have the zebras, and an array of other animals spread across this vast park. Our cameras are planted in different locations and we hope you enjoy the period that our cameras are going to be streaming this live on your platforms. For now, bye-bye. <laughs>